It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. Welcome into Take Command. I'm Craig Hoffman. That is Logan Paulson. And with us today, Logan, I do believe he was our first ever guest. Back again. Third, maybe even fourth time. Uh, If you're a Washington football fan, you've known this man for a long time. (laughs) Certainly if you're a podcaster, YouTuber, uh, you you certainly consume his content as well. Uh, I know that, John Kine, because I look at the analytics and uh, there's a lot of of back and forth between our audiences. We love to send people to you. You love to send them to us. So thank you. you Thank you for... uh, for, for the, the folks that you send our way. There you go. Hey, hey, listen, it's, there's a wide, what I've always looked at on this beat, Craig, is that there's a lot of voices that are need to be heard and are, or, or, are, you know, are good to be heard. Nobody satisfies everybody and people want as much info as they can. And, you know, I know what you guys put into it. So yeah. And that's, stuff. that's why you have Logan on your podcast and I've never been on it. So that's, that's actually not true. I was yeah. on one time, but uh, you know, Hey, we, it, uh, we're happy to have you here. Uh, no, it's, <laughs> Uh, John, John is someone who we've talked about this before, um, made my time on the beat immensely better, uh, show me the ropes in so many ways and has so much knowledge about this franchise. And, um, yet John, with all your experience, never been in a time quite like this, uh, with the ownership <laughs> sale, um, in this particular way, you've been through this in once this before. Way, I say, I, yeah. And, and, and I would say like back when they, when it was sold the first time I did not my off seasons were different back then because I was working for the journal newspapers. I'd cover a lot of high school sports in the off season, high school, basketball, high school, baseball. So I wasn't as deeply in needing to be as deeply entrenched as I would have to be now. And so you're going to know some different things now compared to then. Um, And so like, so it is from, it's a little bit different, but it's not the first time for a sale, but it is a different situation for sure totally different. And then, you know, we'll get into obviously some of the football stuff with John, the other two main stories uh, that have more uh, breaking news, more developments, I think is probably a better way to put it over the weekend. Uh, Offensive coordinator and quarterback, uh, the news that Sam Howell is apparently on a great track to be QB1 and obviously the offensive coordinator position. So we'll get to those in a little bit. But John, you know, JB Finley, our our friend and colleague, put out a story over the weekend with a fair amount of detail. I had a great conversation on Friday with Evan uh, Evan Novi Williams of Sportico, where he gave a lot of detail on kind of the latest on the sale. Um, There is some conflicting stuff out there, though. So as far as your reporting goes, where are we at on like a timeline with things? A lot of people are circling March. How much of that is wishful thinking with the owners meetings? And then what do we know about who's on or off the list of potential buyers for right now? Well, I would say like what you consistently hear is that more likely sooner than later, but it's, it's, it's hard with these kind of things to always to provide any sort of definitive, like, Oh, by this point, it'll be done. And there, you know, it does sound like there's um, a belief or optimism that it would be done that you get to the owner's meetings in late March and perhaps a new owner is um, approved at that time. I've learned that you just, you can never, you can never go quite as far as saying it will be, but I think more so right now, I'd say there are certainly people who expect it to be done sooner than later. How's that? (laughs) (laughs) It's good. It's, it's, it's it's good. You know, you can only go by, you know, again, what people say and the reporting of it. And I do think there's a, there's probably more of a motivation to get it done sooner like that but i don't know you know until it is until we know for sure for sure then it's harder to go beyond that and this is maybe a dumb question but is there like um is there like a group of favorites like a like a class of five people that feel like they're kind of leading the race or is it kind of still up in the air i think there's there's some that have not been uh, not every billionaire wants to be out there and, and to have their names known. And we've learned this before where some are willing to attach their names to certain things or to be more open or whatever. And, you know, we know that like it was a Josh Harris, the, you know, who owns the Sixers um, and, and among other teams. And, you know, he's a name on there. And we know that Jeff Bezos did not submit a bid. And we know that, that Todd Bowley did, but, You know, you hear, I know JP and his story had him as out or likely out. And it's kind of meshes with some things that I'd heard over the last several days. But, you know, 
we knew Byron Allen was interested, but you also knew that he was interested in other teams in the past and could he pull it off? So there just, there's a lot, I think still to, to learn. Um, and there are some who probably feel better than others. And, you know, we go, I know like Harris was a finalist for the Broncos uh, mm -hmm. team back in August. And so he's been vetted by the league. And so I think that's, something that, you know, people know him because of that process. So I think that would certainly bode well for some of those guys on the list, but there's, you know, so. Yeah. So the, not every billionaire wants their name out there was essentially what Eben said about Bezos and kind of still looms because just because of his sheer wealth. And I know there's other complicating factors that we'll get into on some level here, but his sheer wealth goes over this. And this was the same thing that happened with the Broncos was the Walton family didn't want their name in there till the last second because right. they knew then it would just drive up the price that ultimately right. they would win the bidding war, but then they're kind of bidding against themselves. And that is when you're that wealthy, even amongst people that are preposterously wealthy, um, that you don't, you don't necessarily want your name in there. So how much of, in your opinion and reporting, is that what Bezos is going through versus <clears throat> him maybe not actually wanting to get involved in this? I think a little bit is some of that Craig. Um, and I think, I think, you know, you know, that if you get involved, does the price automatically go higher because you're involved and, you know, maybe you want to see, cause here's the other thing, like what has been reported and what we heard is that the price is right now a little over 6 billion with mm. according to the early bids. So if you're Bezos, if you really want it, you could go like, okay, you didn't submit the bid, but like, all right, here's 8 billion. What are you going to do? You're going to say no right. because like, well, you missed the deadline. Well, it's too big. Right. So, right. you know, so I think there's still a way you could do that. I just don't know if the Snyders would want to sell to him. And if that's the case, it may not matter what he offers. And then you turn to other people. So, and it, and it also can be a way for people to, it's almost like a coach sometimes pulling out of a coaching search before they are officially eliminated. It allows you to maybe save a little bit. And I don't know if this is the case or not here, but like it allows you to save some face. Like you weren't turned down, you just didn't submit a bid. You know, and, and you know what I mean? Like, in, you, know, you know how like some coach like, well, I'm, I'm no longer interested in the OC job at Team X. Well, the reality is Team X is gonna hire somebody else. So they allowed right. you to pull out beforehand so you could save some face that you weren't rejected, you just pulled out. So I, I don't, and I'm not saying that again, that that's the case here with Bezos. I don't know. I think a lot of it is more, about where the price goes if you get involved um, and, and, you know, and maybe also knowing that would, would, would Dan sell, would the Snyders sell Tim? And I don't know that. I don't know that they would. Um, I, I don't know how much you can say about that. Is, is there any particular reason why? I mean, I, I know nothing about Jeff Bezos and his relationship to the team. So the fact that his name keeps coming up is always like, did someone just pull this name out of a hat? Has he expressed no, interest? I think there's a, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so. There's always, it sounds like he is someone who has had interest in owning a team for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is a natural, and plus, you know how much money he has and you know how hard it is to, to find people who have that kind of money. I mean, right. you know, that's, you know, that's, that's a little bit different than, than what, would I have lying around the house? So <laughs> that, that is, so that at like, least on a Tuesday. Mattress. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, if I, I should, I probably should check the mattresses more often to see what kind of change I spend. <laughs> yeah. there. But, um, but you know that I think, so I think there's, there's some of that, but I do think that there's been interest in by him in owning a team. It's just, would it, would it be here? Is there, what is their relationship like? Um, there's mm. certain things like, you know, you, you hear things, but it's like, unless you know things for concrete, sure, then it's really hard to report them or to discuss them. But mm. it's just like, I think suffice to say, would they sell to him? And, mm. you know, obviously he owns the Washington Post, but, you know, we know all that. But I think, it, is there more of that, you know? Um, so I think that's where you wonder about that aspect of it. So, but we also know, like I said, we know that Josh Harris is interested because he's bid on other teams and, mm. and, and this was a natural one. If you want to bid on it, do you want to own a team and you, you have ties here, then this is a natural 
you know, fit or a natural mm-hmm. uh, fit or uh, a desire, I should say, to to own one here. So, you know, but I think with Bezos, I think it's there's a combination of things as far as why his name would be attached or why it would be he'd be rumored and, and, and all that. And so sure. there you go. Yeah, he's got the DC ties through the post. I think he owns a house here now. And obviously Amazon just built the huge right. HQ uh, right. in the area. Um, Bowley has, has DC ties. Yeah, also and, so and much money. A, and only, listen, yeah. owning a football team is a good investment. I mean, they the, the, look at has where been. the price tags go on these friends. They don't go down, you know? And there's always ways that the NFL creates a revenue stream. And this franchise... The hard part with this franchise right now is the cost of the stadium and, mm. you know, where are you going to build it and what what is the cost if you build a retractable roof stadium, which is, you know, or is it just a dome? Is it retractable? So then, you know, that's that's you're talking about a few billion there. But if you buy it, then you're also getting a lot of land with it, too, whether it's Ashburn, FedEx. Um, and then do maybe the right, maybe the rights to the property in Woodbridge, if they wanted to sell that. And I don't know like what all it would entail, but so there's a lot there that could also increase the value of it for you once you get that stadium built. And, you know, this, you could view this as, is it almost like a sleeping giant of a franchise, right? Because mm-hmm. there is, it's gone down and yet the value still is high. So how high can it go if the right person comes in? Um, but you know, again, the, the, the value of these teams go up. Yeah. I went super deep on the value part of this with Evan, uh, which I would encourage anyone who's more interested in that to check out that that's a podcast episode, uh, in the Hoffman show podcast feed or on YouTube, uh, for more on why these team values have exploded so much, but very specifically, John, like you were saying to the commanders, the land is so valuable. Um, that, that land in Ashburn, considering yeah. all the, the new business and industry that is coming out there is yeah. The, all the tech stuff is, is wildly expensive land. And then the other thing that's super interesting and JP touched a little bit on this in his story as well. And this is something that also frankly makes Bezos, um, not uniquely, um, interesting, but very, it's another qualification he has is he's so well connected in Congress through all the lobbying that Amazon has obviously done through the years that the RFK site becomes an interesting part of this discussion as well. And JP said there's a chance that they could sell that land in Ashburn to some tech uh, magnate and have just get a bunch of money for it, relocate the facility to Landover, and then could, could whoever the owner is, obviously other billionaires have certainly done lobbying at some point in their lives or have connections in Congress. Um, That kind of comes with the territory. Could you then loosen up the RFK site for a new stadium? Had you heard that as well? That like all of a sudden, oh, definitely, definitely, Washington, definitely, definitely. Washington yeah, can yeah, relocate yeah. to Landover. Well, the land, relocating is still would be you know per, they have the land there, so right. Yes, I mean that, and I well moving that headquarters. Be, that would be a right. That would be a possibility. What what you hear is that the minute that Dan is out, that RFK becomes a more viable option. So and but you could not build the little quote unquote city that they want to build at RFK. Like, you know, that's why the Woodbridge site was appealing for them because all that you could build there and you can't do that at RFK. You can't build your little, you know, the, all the shops and all the restaurants and the hotels around that, like you'd want to. So you'd have to have it somewhere else. So think along the lines of like Dallas and and Frisco with, with their practice headquarters and then where the stadium would be somewhere else. So, you know, I don't, I don't know that it precludes Loudon from getting involved more. I would think they'd want to work hard to keep them with a practice facility, et cetera. So, um, but again, you already have the land over there and you could also sell that land too. So they having land in this area is a pretty good investment. So, you know, I think that would help, you know, I don't know what that does to the sale, but it certainly it could be why the value goes a little bit higher than, and um, certainly higher than what Denver got. Right. And something that we've talked a lot about on this show is kind of like the ownership as perceived by a player. John, like in your perspective and your experience, like what does, I mean, obviously we're talking about, you know, maybe, you know, the stadium getting done, um, sites getting open because of ownership, but are there other things that impact this team that maybe like I'm not aware of as a former player that, that the ownership would bring potentially to the team or, um, or what? Um, I think then it really is about what changes do you make on the staff? Because that's, I mean, I would think if you're a player, 
the number one thing you worry about is your job security. So if, right. you, if this guy comes in and brings in a different staff at some point, how does it impact you? You know, um, Jeremy Reeves is beloved by this staff. Now you, I'm using him as maybe a poor example after the season he had, but guys who are kind of like always on, you know, kind of working their way up and trying to get there. What does a new coach think of you? A guy like Reeves after his season should be fine, but you never know. And so right. you know, what if the guy, new guy comes in and it's like, you know, I want to have a coach that has an offense that does this. And then you now, suddenly you're getting rid of pieces and parts because you don't have what this guy wants, or, or maybe he brings in a new coach who wants that, or, you know, you, you rely more on analytics and, mm. you know, how does that affect everything? Right. So I think there's a lot of trickle down effects that come with a new owner. Now, some guys like, you know, you would think are going to be secure because, hey, you're just you're an all pro, whether it's you know Durant, uh, John Allen, if they re-sign Payne or like Terry McLaurin. But a lot of other guys you're going to wonder about, well, how does it affect my status? So I think that's where I think you'd wonder what where does he go with things? But I really don't think for a player that you'd have to worry about that for for at least a year, because if the season goes well this year, then you don't worry about it because it's the business would continue. But if it if it doesn't go as well as you need, then what? All right. Last thing on the ownership front. I um, mean, this has been obviously the most pressing question uh, for fans along those lines is like, how does that affect everything this off season? Uh, there was talk about whether or not, Oh my God, is he going to have to ask Dan to fire Scott Turner? Obviously, uh, if they did have that conversation, it was pretty quick in their very quick phone call on Monday. Uh, and, and that got done, but that was an assistant coach, Deron Payne. Um, you know, some of the other guys, Reeves, by the way, a free agent. Um, how does, how does this pending sale and the timeline of it affect their football operation from your understanding? And, you know, how much also might you better be able to answer this in a couple of days? Because Rivera was supposed to meet with ownership, what was it, yesterday right. as we record this on a Tuesday, uh, and that got pushed back reportedly till later in the week. Right, right, right. So until we, until we know more about what their budget is, it's really hard to say all the impact, but I, it does sound like everything is going, um, I think the plan is to at least certain, do try to sign a Duran Payne. Um, and, you know, so I don't know how much business will change. They, again, this group has been through before in Carolina, and I don't know that they took a much different approach that off season than previous ones, despite the similar uncertainty. So I don't know, but we don't know until a budget is set and they know more, but you do have to, in the NFL, you obviously have to spend a certain amount because of cap, you know, you're supposed, you have to get to a certain amount, but then it's really about what kind of bonuses are you willing to give to a player or whatever and how much you're willing to invest in this. Um, so I think there's still more to be learned there, but they're right now, it seems like they're operating as if they'll be okay to do things that they want to do and need to do. Take a man podcast from Odyssey Sports. I'm Craig Hoffman. That's Logan Paulson. ESPN's John Kime with us. Of course, the John Kime Report. You can check out anywhere you're listening or watching this podcast right now. He does a great job. Uh, also, the Therapy Tuesdays. How, do, how does it work in the off season? Is it therapy? Is it a celebration? Like, well, what do you guys do on Tuesdays? Th ther therapy's on hold a little bit um, because, you know, um, Johnny needs a break sometimes, too. Um, <laughs> but, every therapist um, needs a therapist yeah but well they will it will be trust me they, they will come back and sometimes it's not therapy tuesday it might be there was a taylor tuesday because heineke was doing well it could be a um gosh you can't do anything a sam sunday i don't know um i, don't, I'm not I mean sure you could I if you did it on sundays night, but yeah, yeah, howling at the moon on Tuesdays. I don't know, um, <laughs> but you know, we'll we'll do that. We'll do that when when it's when it's relevant. When there's a big move, I'll do more some more live shows. I enjoy doing that because you get questions right away, and you you can address certain topics that fans really want to know about, and you get a sense of that. So whether it's that or some mailbag sessions, we'll we'll do some of that in the off season. But nothing right now is scheduled yet, but maybe soon. There you go. Uh, John and Bram uh, do a great job with that stuff. All right. Uh, you had a new report this morning, uh, a kind of updated new list, some new names emerging potentially, uh, and kind of categorizations for those names in terms of how likely it is they may or may not become the new offensive coordinator for the Washington Commanders. What is the latest as far as you understand it on well, how they're approaching the search? Well, 
the the ones that you know for sure, Pat Shermer, and I believe he is meeting there today, Tuesday, and then um, Charles London, quarterbacks coach from Atlanta, they'll meet with him. Eric Studisville, who is um, assistant head coach and running backs coach in Miami, is another guy that they will be hoping. There, I don't think anything is set up yet, but he's another guy certainly of strong interest. Um, Daryl Bevel, who's also in Miami, is another guy that that they'd like to, I think, talk to. But I think it sounds like he might be in a wait and see mode, like how other jobs shake out, what it means for him, at other, whether there or other places. Um, so those are some of the guys right now. And, you know, some of the other names that may, I know Jim Caldwell was a name, a guy that they contacted right now. He's trying, he, his goal is to become a head coach. I think Frank Reich, you can throw in there as well. And um, then it's like, well, you know, so I think they're going to, that's a wait and see with them. Like if they get hired or they don't get hired, we don't know. So, and how long are you willing to wait? So I think, but right now those are, that's what we know. I do know there'll be more. Um, Ken Zampezi, of course, you know, we've known that from the beginning is on that list. So that's another one who will be interviewed. Um, so there you go. Yeah. Logan, I'm going to spin this to you real quick before you ask whatever you want to ask of John. You, we talked last week about some of the like kind of prerequisites, some of the things, the, the characteristics we expected from the OC uh, based off of having to learn an offense, based off of all these different factors, quarterback, thoughts, et cetera. Any of those names jump out at you as, as really particularly interesting based off of any of the characteristics? Um, yeah, I think there are, obviously there's nobody that I know of on that list. And maybe John knows differently that are directly associated with Ron, you know, from like a coaching history standpoint, which is something that I thought Ron was going to like really lean heavily into. But I do think all of the candidates or most of the candidates kind of abide by this core principle, right? Like Daryl Bevel, for example, he was with the Seahawks from 2011 to 2017. And like, they are a run first team. Like think Marshawn Lynch beast mode. Like that's what they did. They were very good at that. He's, it is a West coast philosophy, but um, you know, they run the football and they know how important it is. And they know how that important that is to insulating a quarterback. Charles London is the quarterback coach in Atlanta and they run the football more than anybody in the NFL per opportunity. Right. Oh, wow. Eric's, Eric Studsville is he worked for Gary Kubiak when Gary Kubiak was in Denver. Right. That's where Kyle was at that same time. Right. So there are opportunities here. Uh, Pat Schumer, I'm drawing a blank because I know I just did some research. He has some history in terms of running the football and calling plays as well. I do think and developing that young I, quarterbacks, too. I think right. the other key is developing young quarterbacks. Right. And so I think the thing that I look at with this list is I am going to lean a little bit more towards guys who've called plays before. And like John and I were talking about this off air before we started. So like Daryl Bevel moves to the top of the list, right? Eric Studsville is a guy that moves to the top of the list. I think to John's point, uh, Studsville is a guy that seems like he's up for like a head coaching kind of deal if the situation's right. And same with Darren Bevel. So I think those, those two candidates are guys that jump out from a name standpoint, Pat Schumer as well. But usually the higher quality of the candidate, I feel like is they're, they're less likely – to take an opportunity like this, because this opportunity has some baggage associated with with it, which we've talked about. <clears throat> that's like, a how do you feel about that, John? Like, do you think? I that's think that's the... a, I think that's the number a number one challenge for people, <clears throat> and I think the way that they're going to have to frame it is if you think that the issue was play calling, and like, hey, listen, you got look at Brian Robinson, look at these three receivers, look at these young tight ends. You know, and they're going to tell them how much they're going to invest in the offensive line. And so if it works for you here, you could be on a maybe for some of them could be on a quicker path to a head coaching job somewhere else. So that's that's how they're going to have to, to, to sell it to people. And, you know, or it could just be for some others, like they just want to get back to calling plays and this may be their shot. They right. do have experience with it. But I do think it's a it's a little bit of um a tough situation because of the unknowns and the number one unknown of course is the owner. And then whoever the new owner is, what's their um, opinion of Rivera and the staff and in how, what kind of leash will they give him? Will they give him a year or two, or will you just say, Hey, see what happens this year. And if it doesn't work, you're pulling the plug. So those are questions that, and that's, it's really hard to answer. And one thing, Logan, too, I, there are, if you're going to, if you have a choice, 
and you're a young up and comer, like for example, a guy like I always bring up Brian Johnson, coach with the Eagles, quarterbacks coach with the Eagles, mm -hmm. whose name has been mentioned for a few different places. If you're a guy like that and you have some choices and you're a young guy, you're going to go to the situation where you have more time to prove yourself. Right. So that would be, so you may miss out on some guys like that. It doesn't mean the end of the world. It just means you may miss out on some guys like that. And then you may have to end up going with a guy who's a little bit more experienced just because they want to get back to calling plays. But I also know I've talked to some people who are like, you know, you know their, their guy would love to have this chance because they know mm. how hard it is to get that opportunity for some, for, for some in the business. And, you know, so like there is, there's, there are a bunch of ways to look at it, but it is, it's just like a free agent. If you offer them the most money, chances are that's where they're going to go. But if you have a choice, then you're going to choose between maybe organizations. And I think right. the same is true here. And then it's going to matter. Like, did you like Sam Howell when he was in college or not? You know, did yeah. you like what you saw or not? I think that's going to depend on it too. I think you're going to like the receivers. You're going to like the running back. And you're probably going to, you know, I would think you'd like the tight ends. Don't you think, Logan? I think so. I mean, I think I, I think they're a young group and I don't think there's a lot of film out there on them. But I think, you know, in talking with Ron and talking with everyone in the building, like they're going to sell that group. And it's not yeah. a hard sell from an athletic no, outside I, standpoint. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, I think there are guys there that like I really am anxious to see what Rodgers does next year. I think, you know, I yeah. think there's a lot of good stuff that they showed. And it's hard because there's always – they want to be a run first team. They have talent, the skill position. And this was an issue this past year because you toggle between you want to run the ball, but yet you got McLaurin, Dotson and Samuel and some of these young tight ends. But you, you know, so it's hard to, and then if you don't, if you throw the balls like, well, why isn't so-and-so getting as many touches? Well, because we're running the ball, you know, that's how they're going to, right. that's how they were thinking there. And so, it's, it's hard sometimes with that, but I do think that you can use some of those guys maybe a little bit more effectively um, than that, what, they, what they feel they had been used and the talent is there. So that's how you're going to sell it. And if it, again, if it works for you, then you could be getting a head coaching job in a year or two. Now, mm -hmm. the only problem with that is then you're losing a guy in a year or two. So yeah. what I would do, like what you'd want ideally is to have, and this is where I always thought the Shanahan's were set up well, that you had replacements on staff to move up. And do they have those guys now? I think that's one thing you'd wonder. And then it depends on whoever you bring in, who do they want to bring in, right, to have that? So, like, do you have some guys who can elevate if you lose that guy so that way you're not changing systems all the time, but you can roll with, okay, so-and-so left, well, the system stays the same because so-and-so is going to elevate to that job. That's where that's where you so that way you don't if the guy if you do have that kind of success, you're not completely changing over every all the time. And do you think that this new candidate would have the opportunity to bring their own staff with them? Or do you think that that's something that kind of is looming? I, I do think I, I don't know if it'd be an I don't think an overhaul, but I do think they're mm -hmm. you know, I think they're it sounds like an open to hearing what you want to do and with who, because there right. are definitely some coaches on the staff that I know they like and want to keep. So right. I don't know that they want to change everything. Um, and I don't know that you need to change everything. But, right. a, but, new I mean, coach but I mean, a new coach will want their people. Yeah. I mean, and no but doubt. Like, you know, you, for, for like Daryl Bevel, for example, like that's an outside mm -hmm. zone emphasis, right? right? And Matt Scow is not really an outside zone emphasis kind of guy. So right. do you, do you make that transition? And I, you know, I don't right. know, but like, that seems like one that would be, if you're changing offensive philosophy, you need to make sure you get the coaches in here. You can coach it the way you Correct. want it. And, and I, I was going to say, is there the, anybody that Rivera is going to be like, no, that person has to stay? Well, I don't, I don't know for sure, but I think Matt's guy would be one where you'd say, mm. you better make, give me a good reason why he shouldn't mm. come back. You know what I mean? Right. Like, cause I mean, we know the respect that he has for him. And um, so I think that, you know, but I don't know who I don't have, I don't know who would be considered untouchable. But I know like Randy Jordan was kept from the previous staff. You have to really like a guy to keep them from a previous staff, you know? And so I, I do, I think there's some that you would say you have to make a strong case why a change should be made here. Um, I don't know that it would stop them from doing anything. I don't know that. Real quick before we uh, get to the quarterback stuff and the impact that's going to have on this whole situation. 
Is there any word on the defensive side definitively? Because there was some there was some stuff floating around earlier in the season when things weren't going well, and obviously Del Rio had the whole uh, kerfuffle over his comments that were uh, about more than a kerfuffle. Um, that he was basically being a good soldier and was going to survive the season, and then the defense turns it around, and now it se- it seemed nuts to make a change. Uh, at any point in that staff because of how well that those units played this year. Um, and really the only thing that could keep them down was offensive ineptitude and injuries. Um, do we know for sure that Del Rio is coming back and, and everyone else on that side of the ball is staying in place? Um, do we know for sure? I mean, I don't know that the question was necessarily asked directly. I don't know why you'd make a change. Well, more of like if Jack wanted to, he was like, you know, I'm good. Well, he, like I would. Well, if he want if he would, but that I don't know. So I don't know. That would be a different, con- you know, and I don't know that. Um, but everything, every conversation I've had, there's nothing that suggests that there would be a desire to change. But if, if Del Rio decides, you know what, I'm done with it. It was just too much of a headache this past year, blah, blah, blah. Then, you know, then I'm done. I don't know that. But all the planning, it sounds like the expectation is that, um, you know, I mean, they did make the change too in the summertime with Sam Mills. So that was mm-hmm. one change, but I don't, you know, like Chris Harris, does he get looks at for some jobs? I don't know. Um, so, yeah. but I, I would think they would be back based on, I haven't heard anything to the, con- I would just say this, Craig, I haven't heard anything to the contrary. Sure. And, and I feel like you, if there was something out there like, oh, they're still deciding that it would have floated past your radar by now. Um, obviously, if Chris Harris were to get an interview and a job, that changes things. That's but, different. Um, yeah, yeah, listen, that's, that's different. Ultimately, ultimately, you want guys on your staff who are wanted by other teams because it right. means you're having success. That's you don't like. They've had a high level of stability, which is good. But I also think at some point you you want because it, it means you're having success that if other guys on your staff are getting looked at and that they think of them highly. And so I I do think you want a level of that, but. Um, you know, I think injuries have hurt them with the defense at the back seven. I think they need to build their depth more than anything. And when you hear about defensive improvement, typically it's about building more depth and solidifying certain spots. So last thing I'll ask then before we go to quarterback, hundred uh, percent last thing, as opposed to the last thing, which I said was going to be the last thing, but isn't, uh, on, on, or early in the year when some of that stuff was happening, there was this talk of whether like Jack actually wanted Jamin in the first place. And obviously that turned out, you know, people like me who were screaming about how unfair it was to Jamin, um, that they were singling him out. They seemed to know what they were doing there. He played incredibly after he got called out. So be it. There's a report from standing over the weekend that Scott Turner, uh, wasn't on board uh, f- with the Carson Wentz thing. And I'm sure there's a lot more nuance to that, but that's kind of the headline. So I, I would ask you this, how much is it a focus this off season to be perhaps a little bit more uh, together as a, a staff, as a front office, or is, is there a need for that? And this, these are just sometimes the kinds of disagreements that happen. And then if something doesn't go well, it comes out in the press in the off season, or is there a, well, a, a cohesion problem between some areas of the staff, the front office, and obviously Ron in the middle of everything? I, let me say this about quarterbacks, every quarterback thing I've ever covered. Anytime a guy, there's a change somebody was always against that after the fact. A hundred percent. So I don't, you know, and, and I think you sometimes, a lot of times I go by, what did you hear at the time? Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, so. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, mean? so we've, we've talked about this before. Like, it's so funny. Like when you do like draft eval, like that's a really simple one, right? You'll talk to 10 different people about the same Mm -hmm. person and they'll all be all over the map. Mm -hmm. Correct. And like, I don't love X about this guy. And I'm like, well, do you see it? And they're like, yeah, you see it. But you always, like when you go back, let's say the guy's a bust. They always have this thing in the bag where they're like, I didn't love him at the time. I, you know, I had this reservation about him. Right. right? And people right. do that all the time. All the time. And, like, well, well, the and time. there's also levels. Um, yeah. For instance, I'll right. go back to my reporting days on the Alex stuff. And one of the coaches I talked to at the time who was on staff was like, yeah, I wasn't consulted on Alex, but we were asked for reports uh, two Correct. weeks before the trade. And so while this very involved person at the time and who was going to have to coach Alex wasn't directly asked as the trade was on the table, hey, do you want Alex Smith? 
you know, Alex was a part of their rankings and their reports right. a couple of weeks prior as potential right. available quarterback. Right. So at some right. point, Scott was certainly asked about Carson Wentz and gave a report of some kind. So even if it wasn't like, hey, Scott was on board pounding the table for Wentz, mm. if he had been like hard, no, terrible, will never work in this offense, I'm sure they would have probably given that some consideration. Uh, I'm guessing that did not happen. And there was probably like a, hey, I really like his strong arm. I like this. I like that. And that's more, ultimately that's they pulled the trigger. You, yeah, that's more what you would hear. So, but it's like, you know, listen, I, like I said, every time there's something like this, there's always a, you know, so-and-so whatever, you know, I, I'm, yeah. I don't want to, because I don't want to even say too much because it's it's not my reporting, but I know what, what my reporting, where that has led me. But um, so it's, that stuff happens. Also very predictable after uh, the coach gets fired. So there's, yeah, there's that's that. what I mean. That, that's what I mean. So it's you know it's, the, you know it's funny because um, one of the ones who wasn't quite like that was Jay, and I remember talking to him after, even after like when he was fired, he would talk about the Dwayne Haskins pick, and while he did not like that at 15, he also said that's not the reason why we were 0 and five. Mm, Do you know what I mean? Like, right. So like he wasn't he wasn't going to point that as like well if they had just let me take Montez Sweat at fifteen we wouldn't and someone else in the second that's not what it was so right um, you know All right although that one was a pretty pure ownership play so that was oh that's also in a different play. category but I appreciate that Jay says that where he's like well, yeah it would have been better yeah, for me sure but that wasn't the reason yeah, we yeah. were zero and five and we knew he wasn't on board with it at fifteen I think if they had taken him a couple rounds later or even the second round or so. I think they would have been like, okay, that's good value. I think at 15, they did not view it as good value. And he was one of them. And he's like, well, how much, how patient are you going to be with me? If you're, if you're going to take him there, knowing what had the work that had to go into it and what they were told the work that have to go into getting it there. So, but the point is he didn't use that as, as a reason why he was, they were 0 five in that last year. Take a man podcast from Odyssey Sports. That's John Kime from ESPN with me, Craig Hoffman, him, Logan Paulson. Uh, all right. So, quarterback, speaking of, all of a sudden it appears that Sam Howell is on track to be QB1. Uh, what's what's the latest intel there? And then I'd love to kind of bat this idea around because I actually think this is a great thing for a couple of reasons. But what's what's the from the reporting intel side, John? What have you been hearing over the weekend? Well, I think the only question is who presents him in Canton. I think that's what that's the only question left. Like who's <laughs> who's going to give him the gold jacket? No. Um, listen, I think what what it is, and and I I joke because obviously there's we're, first of all we're going to have about seven months of speculation about what could Sam Howell do in 2023, which I think is actually based off what he showed in that last game. Is it's you know it's not the worst thing. It's like. I mean, he certainly showed traits and he showed traits yeah. in college too. So it's not, it's not a bad thing. I think where, where we're at with it is first of all, he's going to in, well, whenever they cut Carson Wentz, he'll be the only quarterback under contract uh, on the roster, you know, who is on the 53. So there's a natural, yeah, this is the guy. They're still going to look for somebody else, but more so sounds like to compete with him. And if not, if they don't win the job, then you're going to back him up. Who can who can be that guy? And it, it could be Taylor Heineke. It could be someone else of that caliber, a guy who would be considered a a very solid back, a high end backup, but a guy who can go out there and win. You know, if he has to start five or six games, can win three or four for you. So that's that's kind of like where it seems like they're going to go with this now you always have to leave out that, well, you never know because what if so-and-so becomes available and all it takes is X and, you know, you, and you love that guy in the past, like, you know, what do you do? But right now the signs point to the other. And again, I think it goes back to a lot that these guys liked him before the draft. Uh, and I think they would have, cons and I've talked about this before, but they would have drafted him higher had they not traded for Carson Wentz. So I think they, you know, there was, it was, it's not like hindsight hearing that they liked him. It was before the draft. I heard what, that they liked him, at least certainly some over there liked him. And um, so I think there's legit intrigue and optimism about him. 
But I think you have to then get, that's why it's going to be important. The coordinator is somebody who can, who has worked with young quarterbacks and knows how to develop them. And somebody whose system, as Logan said, protects the quarterback as well. That's going to be a big deal because you're, you're not going to just go out there and start flinging the ball 40 times a game with Sam Howell next year. You want to put him in a good spot. And I think we saw the other day in one game, small sample size, but you saw some of what he can do in certain situations. So, you know, I, I think there is a definite intrigue and optimism about him, but I think they also aren't ready to just say he's absolutely the number one going into the season. It's in the off season. He's going to go in there as a number one, going to bring someone else in there to compete and then see where it goes. But he's got yeah. a good start on it. I mean, I, <clears throat> I totally agree. I mean, I think like in the last week, you know, of the season, like after the, the victory over Dallas, like that's what everyone was talking about in the building. That's kind of the direction it seemed it was going. Mm -hmm. So now that it's here, it's, it's really not surprising. Uh, you know, I, I agree with John. I think he's got some traits. I think you feel excited about him. I think the thing that is more uh, kind of dubious, in my opinion, is like, can they hit on two offensive linemen this offseason? Right. That becomes like the bigger question, in my opinion, because like you can make this work. I think you like look at Seattle. I think Seattle's a very interesting kind of juxtaposition. You have a, a guy who's been a journeyman quarterback, comes in, plays really well, but you also get two rookie offensive linemen who were taken yeah. very high, who hit and played very well for them mm -hmm. for most of the season. And their offense played as they played. When those two young tackles played well, the offense was good. When they played poorly, the offense was bad. And so to me, like, yes, it's, it's exciting to kind of draft a young offensive lineman, but look at Evan Neal, for example, look at Ikea Kwanu. like it took those guys a couple of weeks and Evan Neal is still figuring it out. Correct. So how do you shore it took Andrew up that Thomas a couple years. It took Andrew Thomas a year or so to figure it out. Yep. A year, right. like a full year. Yeah. Now he's one of the best right. guys in the NFL, but it took a year yeah. to get there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But so I think that that's something that is, it's, it seems like, it seems like it's close, right? It seems like, oh yeah, like there's the door. We just got to walk through it. But I think it's a smaller margin for error than people think. And I think that, yeah. to me, becomes the more interesting storyline. Because I, I agree. Sam showed traits. Yeah. He showed qualities. Right. And he's got, you know, like, all those things are good. But unless you find a way to make sure that he's not at a buffet table every time he's playing a defense, like, that's going to be tough. And you got to hit on, on two positions that traditionally – evaluate very easily and it should be good to hit them right they get like the yeah. offensive line compared to corner are tend right. to be easier evaluations for example but the the timetable isn't always immediately a good football right. player and so right. if you're ron like how do you manage some of that risk that's a good point and i would i i do have to point out that only a former run blocking tight end the nfl would say as exciting as it would be to draft a lineman in the first <laughs> round nobody else is going to say that so that's I, I I I have to smile at that one. Hey, if 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 you asterisk it with <laughs> lets you start Sam Howell, the fan base is in. We don't, yeah. if we can draft a punter in the first round and that lets everybody start Sam Howell. Well, I guess that's a bad example because no, be Tress mad. is here. It'd be so mad because Tress is so good. But you get the point. It does. If we could draft a long another long snapper, all due respect to Cameron Cheeseman, and it meant Sam Howell started, the fan base would be psyched. Yes, they would be. But I will say to Logan's point, yes, it's very difficult to get a guy to come in and do it. I think the other key is you need to really build up that depth on the line if you're going yeah. to play this kind of style of football. And I yeah. don't think it's really the, the two to one ratio is you're not going to achieve that. Some no, games, I also feel like, like that quote depth, got taken terribly out of context. Like I feel I like what you talked about a, is that he was talking specifically about the Dallas game. That like because wanted, the I, game flow – and they got to right. two to one, and that's how it worked out. And everyone's like, that's the goal. It's like, no, it's not. He was talking about the game yesterday. What are you well, guys saying? I think he's talking about that. I think it's also the mentality of how you want to be. And I think in their minds, it's two to one comes from, you know, you're having success early, and then you take a two touchdown lead in the fourth quarter, right? And icing it away with the run game. Well, that's every coach's dream scenario, but, <laughs> right. you know, but I do think it speaks more to the mentality of what they want to be as much as whatever the numbers are two to one. Again, you're not going to achieve that. Certainly maybe in some games you will, but overall you're, it's just, it's really hard. So, but it's the mentality of how you want to be. You want to be that bait, like Kyle Shanahan's offense is based a lot off the run game, but they're not. 60 40 run right they're pretty close to 50 50 but so much of that 50 50 is based off 
an element of the the element of the run game. And like, which I, and I know Logan, you love, but I love, I love watching that offense for that reason, but it's so much based off, you know, they want to do this and it looks like this yet it's a pass. So it, to me, that's all based off the run mentality and the run game. And so I think that's, I think that's what they'd like to be. So you get that run heavy, you know, and, and you get the play action off of that in addition to the quick game. But so I think the question there too, along the line is, do you push Sam Cosme inside? And I, my guess is that's my guess is that's what ultimately happens. And you go find the right tackle in the first round. Maybe if there's somebody there, I, the other thing is like, I don't, I would not force a pick at, at 16 as far as the line goes, right. It's gotta be somebody that you like. And I've seen when teams force that, then you end up in trouble. Now, part of the reason why I think Lyman hit a little bit more, because if you do force a tackle, you take a tackle, let's say, let's say you take a tackle at number five, and he shows in the first camp that he can't be a tackle, you can make him an all-pro guard, right? And then he signs with Jacksonville a few years later. But you know what <laughs> I mean? Like, so you can so you can, but you, but it gives you more hit ability right. because of that. But if you're pushing Cosme inside, you need this guy to hit as a tackle. So right. get get a good tackle there if you can. And I would take another guy in the first several rounds. I I try to add another couple picks in those first few four rounds to then get another guard in there, a guard center or center, somebody else inside. Because if you're going to play that style, you better have strong replacements. And I think one of the issues that they had this year is they didn't replace the starters they lost well, but the ones they did elevate, um, it, it didn't, it didn't, like guys that should have been depth guys ended up starting and it robs your depth. So right. you know, I think that's, that's something they have to work out. But it is a – to me, that is the number one thing. All the other stuff aside – you can mask some things with the with the coordinator and the play calls, but you need to have that strong line. And that's what Rivera said he wants to build. They have a really good defensive line right now with, with the addition of Ridgeway, and we'll see what Mathis becomes. And then if they keep paying, you have an excellent defensive line rotation. Right. Um, right. But can you get that in the O-line? I think that remains to be seen, and that is the number one job this offseason. Yeah, uh, a couple of things just to tack on there. Um, there's a reason why Warren Sharp uh, does a lot of his stats on first and second down in the first half. Yeah. Um, and when you talk about right. like the predictability yeah, of these types of things, the the ratios, um, how often you run or pass on first down, like he limits it to those situations because game flow tends to dictate a lot of the larger things. Correct. So like Correct. better teams run the football more because they're up in games. And so by the end, like your ratios right. are messed up. But what do they look like? Correct. How did they get the lead? Um, so that's something that'll be interesting. We'll have to have Warren back on the show. I'm sure you've and, had Warren and, before to talk on your show about those things and how Washington approaches it. Right. And, and what, what I think the other interesting part of that too, is like when, you know, cause there, there is the desire that you want, you have guys who can be explosive on the outside with the three, those three receivers all can be, have a level of explosiveness that can help this offense. How do you get them involved with it? When do you get them involved with it? And then when do you take your shots? And so if you go to the Kyle model, a lot of those shots are first down play action. And he's really good with that because of that. And I think you, you know, because again, you know that they want to run the ball and they make it look that way, but you run the heavy play action off of that and it leads to some bigger plays. And then other plays come within, like the other day, we saw them getting the ball to Samuel on some shorter throws, but they create space with the, with the, um, with alignment, with, with route, combos etc and then suddenly you have Debo Samuel running away from guys underneath and turning a five-yard catch into a 25-yard gain I think you know we saw an element of that with Dotson in the in the, in the finale so yeah. you know that that too I don't even know how I got on that part oh you're talking about the first and second downs so it is it's just a way how do you get to certain things and you're right it's not just as simple as looking at a percentage of run pass because then the other thing with that that always kind of drives me nuts a little bit nuts and Logan maybe you can talk more on this, but when you have, I remember just talking to people in the past, like the run pass ratio 50, 50, it doesn't always tell you if you're balanced or it doesn't tell you if you're balanced or not. The balance to me comes in Logan to value your input here, but it comes on what kind of runs are you using? What kind of throws are you using? How are you using people? So even within the run game, just because you run it 50% of the time doesn't mean you're balanced. What if you're running the same things off of the same action, et cetera? How do you get to those runs? I think that's where, and how do you get to those passes? That to me is where the true balance is. And that's a, that's a much deeper dive than, than, than I can do. 
Yeah, well, I just want to – I think that's a great point. Like, I hate – that one of my least favorite statistics in the NFL is when they say person X runs the ball 30 times, they win the game. It's, right. it's a spurious right. correlation. It, it, yes. it, it's yes. correlated because they're being really efficient on first and second down, and they're, they have a high third down conversion rate. Those metrics are more indicative, right? So, to me, it's not the running necessarily that gets you there. It's that, like you took, as you're saying, it's the balance and it's the rhythm. It's right. like, so I'm, I'm going to go back to the San Francisco game here. And it was like, Scott was like, he was, he, he knew that they needed to run the football. So they came out and they ran the football and they just ran it and they just bashed their head against the wall. A different offensive coordinator takes that and they say, how do we loosen this up to get back to the run? Let's throw the football off of play action, off of keeper, off of screen, whatever it is, off of kind of some misdirection action to open up the pass concept and get them out of these kind of heavy run structures and then get back to the run. The balance comes off of that type of rhythm. Right. It's not give the running back 30 touches and you're going to win the game. Like that's just, <clears throat> that's not right. how that works. Right. So no. I think understand having someone that understands that and understands that they can support a young quarterback with that is something that's really important. So it's like, it goes back to the coordinator thing. You need to have someone who's familiar with that. Kubiak is kind of like the first disciple of Mike, Mike Shanahan you know, then Mike Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan, Mike McDaniel, Matt LaFleur, all those guys, they run a version of this offense. Yeah. They run a version of this. Uh, and I don't think anyone would say those offenses aren't explosive. They are explosive no. offenses. They find right. good chunk plays. They insulate the quarterback. They give them easy decisions. Like look at Justin Jefferson. They're running a version of this Kyle Shanahan offense, right? And he's leading the NFL in, in, in explosive plays. Like, that's what you can get out of this. So it's not this arcane, let's go back to this two-in-one, like, leather helmets thing. It's like, that is innovative offense. And you need someone who understands that innovation and that level of nuance. So I think that's something that's interesting. But kind of back to the original point, it's like, how do you how do you put them in the best position to do that, Sam Howell? How do you make sure you get good offensive linemen to do that? And how do you make sure you get a coordinator that can do that? So it's all there. Like, the path is there. It's just it's it's a tough road it can't it's i think the margin for error on this is a little bit smaller than a lot of fans want to want to acknowledge i want to say right but at the same time like this is what drives me nuts when it's like well how they want to run the ball but i got to get the ball to the playmakers if only there was a way they could do both by finding some balance and playing one off the other it's like the the biggest failing of scott turner's 2022 season is the offensive coordinator I'll limit it to just this season is the lack of play action use because their run game was so effective at times and play action is how you generate big plays most often in the NFL and they did not use it enough and they did not leverage the things they did well and the skill sets they have to create big explosive plays and it's just so disappointing and ultimately it's why I think his his removal is justified even though there's a bunch of other structural issues that you could easily point to and say, well, how is he expected to perform under these circumstances? Well, you evaluate the job that he did and you go, he didn't maximize, come close to maximizing what he had, even if any reasonable person would have wanted more from their quarterback, from their offensive line, et cetera. And by the way, the things that he didn't do would have helped those pieces be better. And that is the frustrating part where it's just, there's this gigantic, somewhat obvious gap that just was never filled throughout the season. Well, and I, to that point, it is funny because you'd hear, it wouldn't be widespread, but certainly there was a lot of dissatisfaction with Scott. And I think, you know, not just in the fan base. I mean, I think if you, you certainly knew the players were frustrated, especially at the end, that's when it started to come out a lot more and that the risk was less in getting rid of him than it was in bringing him back. Because if it didn't, if it didn't improve, then you've, you've, you've completely lost the team. And you, that was a big risk. But to the point um, with what you're saying, I'd hear like, I'd hear from people like the line sucks. The quarterback sucks. They got to fire Scott Turner. Well, it's kind of hard. If you think that they don't have that, then, then how is, what is he supposed to do? However, I know I, I do remember um, back in the day when Kyle was there, was here calling plays. And I always like, it's funny. Cause like Kyle's become like this, the um, grand Puba of Washington play callers or whatever, but he was really, really good. And I, and you know, I do remember <laughs> like, I mean, you know, maybe he's Yoda for them, but I do remember there was dissatisfaction with him among the fan base, partly because they got, they didn't, maybe they didn't like Mike. And so they didn't like Kyle by extension um, whatever. And I also know, I don't know that it was a majority, but you heard it. Right. 
But I remember in 2011 watching his offense and watching guys like Dante Stallworth and Jabbar Gaffney at the end of their careers getting open on these route concepts. And I'm like, well, it's there. So like this stuff is working. It's just that you had um, John Beck and Rex Grossman throwing passes to him. And like Rex, they would move the ball. Then you get in the red zone, he's throwing a pick. You know, and, and sometimes Rex just – Rex knew he couldn't help himself sometimes. Like, you know, it's kind of like a guy – but it's like it's like a guy who wants to go on a diet and it's like, my God, that cherry pie looks good. All I need is some ice cream on it a la mode and there we go. And now next thing you know, that diet – like all this commitment to the diet is over in within a couple hours, right? That's a little bit how Rex was throwing the ball. Like he wanted to take care of it, wanted to take care of it. And then you see something that's like, oh, oh baby – Let's go. And that, and then it would be a pick. So, but what the point of it is, you saw that the offense worked and you wondered more so like, what would it look like with better talent there? Because again, within, after that year, Gaffney and Stallworth are out of the league and, you know, you didn't hear from Bex or, or from Beck or Grossman again in the NFL. I mean, Rex was here as a backup, but that's it. So, you know, but you saw it, you saw it work. You saw the chess game that he would play to get guys open and how things married, et cetera, the concepts. And that's always a big thing. The marriage, as you know, like in Cooley, we talk about this, Logan, you talk about the marriage of concepts for the run in the pass game. And I thought that sometimes that was a hard thing to see as well, because you didn't always see guys getting lulled in hard by play action when they did run it. And why was that? And that's, you know, is it, was it, was it, formation um, tendencies preventing that, you know, what, what was it about that, that you, are you running it out of certain looks that you don't really run the ball out of enough to, to fool? I don't know. So there was just a lot of things, but anyway, that's, a, I'm rambling on that, but that there, they kind of, I think I was backing up your point, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, you were, you were. All right. Last thing I want to talk about on the quarterback front to me, this is actually a, a, kind of fortuitous development in this way. There, I had a huge concern that um, Rivera was going to spend big on quarterback. It wasn't going to work. And big could have been monetarily. It could have been draft capital. Could, some sort of uh, capital that you use to acquire a premier quarterback uh, or a premier quarterback prospect. And that it was going to go sideways and he was going to get removed by the new owner uh, at some point, either after next year or during next year. And then you have this same stupid uh, alignment that you've had in the last couple of coaches where Kyle uh, and Mike come in and inherit quarterback. They draft a quarterback is kind of forced on them by ownership. Uh, and then things go sideways. Eventually they get fired. Then Jay comes in, he inherits Robert. Eventually he's able to get to Kirk. They don't right. hold on to Kirk, you know, and then you get Jay and Dwayne, like the whole, the whole misalignment of coaching quarterback. Right. And then we were on that path again. What Sam Howell, uh, being the favorite, because uh, it's not locked in by any means, but the favorite to be QB1 no. does, is say, all right, Ron, let's see what you can do with this guy. If it works out well, then you've got your quarterback and you can continue. And if it doesn't, then the new owner can hire a new GM and a new sure. coach and that that new person can come in and uh, is a quarterback. And I think it's very fortuitous because there is the job of an owner or a team president to have a longer view than the coach. And in this particular case, the owner's view ends sometime later this year. There is no team president on the football side. It is Ron Rivera, essentially. And then all of a sudden, the next most powerful person is either the head coach in this particular case or the GM who is tied to the head coach in this particular case. So to me, John, like the commanders kind of dodge a bullet here. One, I actually think it's probably the best option is to build around Sam and invest in other places. And it, this is actually even with a longer view, probably the best strategy unless something unforeseen becomes available at that position. But it also prevents them from getting in this rut. And I think that is a uh, kind of a fortuitous bounce, if you will, of organizational luck for an organization that doesn't seem to get very many lucky bounces very often. Yeah, no, I think I think that would be, you know, and it's funny because I'm a, if, if there's a quarterback coming out, like you're Jacksonville and you have the number one pick and it's Trevor Lawrence, regardless of who the coach you're taking that person, right? It's right. a no brainer pick because anybody in your position is going to take him. So any coach is going to want to work with him. It's harder when you have other, some other quarterbacks, maybe that you're not sure what the new group thinks of them. And so like with Chicago, with Justin Fields, you took him in the, you know, kind of almost mid first round, a little bit, you know, I guess in that 10 to 15 range, 
um, in the first round. So like, does the new group like him or not? And do they make it work with them? And you got a year to see. And if it doesn't work, then you can go somewhere else. But you do feel like, well, you you have to see if it works with this guy. And and I, you know, so yeah, I think that you know, if you're, would you take a first round pick this year? No, I wouldn't do that. And I don't think they will either. Um, I don't know that anybody in this. I don't know that the guy they would want to develop would be there at 16 anyway. And I don't think you're going to want to trade up and expend the capital to get that guy this year. So, um, so yeah, I think that's not a bad setup and I would, I don't have a problem if they say we're going to build around Sam Howell, if that's what they're going to say, like, I get it. You know, I, is, is he, is he the long-term answer? I don't know, but is he, you know, is he a higher level than, does he have a higher ceiling than a Heineke? Yes, he does because he's Heineke with a stronger arm in some cases. And so I think you can, I think it's justified to go that way, but I'd also have a strong guy right there with him because if it doesn't, then you want that. And also not only that, but there are guys, I think one of the things and that I think that Wentz and Heineke deserve credit for is their willingness, I think, to help him. And I think they were, I think that sounds like it was a very good QB room. It doesn't always happen that way. I've seen it the opposite here. And you you know, so you hear with some of the folks that have come through, believe it or not, there were some times where it was not (laughs) harmonious in that room, but I think it's, it's, it's hard to get guys. Like, I think this is where I always bring up a guy like Jacoby Brissett only because it's the level and the professionalism that the guy has that, you know, he can go in and play, and, and, and if he doesn't, you know, he can handle the other role as well. Cause it's what he's always done. Same with Heineke. I know he'd be okay backing up Howell because he likes him a lot. So you need a guy who can do both things for you. And if they're not starting, they're not going to, they're going to help the guy versus work to, to, you know, to not help him. Um, so I think that's a lot of what, you know, I think you're looking for at that position, but um, so, but yeah, I think you're like, I, when Chicago took took Justin Fields, my first as an Ohio State guy, I'm like, I don't like that pick for him because you knew that they were going to probably change coaches within a year. And so then you're going to have to learn another system and all that. And it makes it hard on a young quarterback. Um, and so much of that success or failure for young quarterbacks is based on where do you go? What plan do they have for you? How much time are they willing to give you? And I think for Howell, that's also certainly the case. And, and the higher the draft pick you are, the more time they give you. So Howell actually found himself in a really good spot where as a fifth round pick playing one game, one start that he's already intriguing enough to, to go in a certain direction in one off season, you know? Yeah. I rambled there. I don't even know what direction I was going, but. (laughs) That's what happens when you're an hour into the podcast. If people, if people continue to listen the whole hour through, they get rewarded with a good Quality, John Kime Ramble. Ramble. It was good. It was awesome. I don't disagree with anything you said, John. So, Same. Uh, anything else that anybody wants to say before this podcast ends? No. Okay. <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. Can you yeah. still say, is it? Is it? I guess it's still Happy New Year. It's January. We're doing this in January 17th. Is it still Happy yeah. New Year? I feel like Chris Berman was always big on the, let me be the first or the last, depending on something around a holiday. Like it's a couple of days after things be like, yeah. let me be the first to wish you. And you'd be like, okay, boomer. It's a little early, but <laughs> thanks for your heart's in the right place. Thanks for the well wishes through my television. Now let's rumble and bumble and stumble into some highlights. Shall we? There you go. All right. Uh, John Kime, uh, John Kime Report podcast. Anywhere you're listening to this podcast, we're watching. If you're on YouTube, uh, make sure you subscribe to the empire media page. For that A M P I R E, I got that right. I think spelling is always my strong strong suit. But uh, Bram did a good job naming the company something that rhymes. Uh, you can go. also read his work at ESPN.com. Uh, follow him on Twitter at John underscore Kime. Anything else, John? That uh, your in- Instagram? I'm on Instagram. It's, I think it's John Kime ESPN. So it is. It is not anything. It is John Kime ESPN. There you go. Because you, you put you put some news and nuggets and film I stuff, do put up, some on stuff there up there too. And- you know, so. Instagram for me has become a very big culinary place Ooh. that you know, the hard part, because like you find one thing you like on there and next thing you know, you get bombarded with stuff. And, yes. you know, I, I, I found some stretches that I like on there. Next thing you know, I have 500 stretch videos coming at me. Then I find like a couple recipes that I really liked. But if that, you think Instagram's bad, don't you go near TikTok. That that no, TikTok I, will have you down a no, rabbit hole worry. like I, you wouldn't I, believe. I, I, think, I think my TikTok days are behind me. I'm like I said, I just... <laughs> 
I just wait. I tell my kids, like, I'll see it on Instagram in two months. So there, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's also very true. All right, just make yeah. sure you follow John uh, in all of those places as if you're not already. Logan and I will be back on Thursday with a fresh pod. Uh, so we'll talk to you then. Thanks for listening to Take Command. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command. First, why don't, you, why don't you like it? It lets other people know that it was good, and then they should watch it too. And Logan, we have a new exclusive home for full episodes. We do. 1067, the fans YouTube page. Go check it out and please subscribe. Yeah, do, do what Logan said. Do He's it. Very, very smart.